think we should start. Yeah. It's been <laughs> we're rolling a bit behind time. So I'm Paul. I'm a fourth year medical student here in Bristol. Um, I'm also president of LGBT Health, um, which is Bristol Medics LGBT Society. Um, I'm also on the, on the student rep for the LGBT special interest group for Royal College of Psychiatry. So to start with, just to gauge how much you guys actually know, um, we'll do a few true or false questions. Um, a lot of these were taken from the Stonewall survey, which was carried out on 5,000 LGBT people. So I think it's probably best if you just shout true or false. Um, so LGBT people are twice as likely to experience violence in their youth. Half of LGBT people said they experienced depression in the last year. True. It's true. Twenty-five percent of trans people thought about taking their own life in the last year. <laughs> Does that sound um, so that's actually false. Does anyone know what the true figure is? So it's 46%, which is obviously very high. Um, one in 20 LGBT people have avoided treatment for fear of discrimination because they're LGBT. Do you think it's higher? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, one in seven is the real figure. So again, that's quite high. Um, one in six LGBT people said they drank alcohol almost every day for the last year. That is true. Um, does anyone know what alcohol dependency within the rest of the population is in terms of figure? Is it one in seven? So it's a lot less. I think the figure that I seen was less than about, it was about one percent. Um, so obviously this is a lot higher than that. Um, a quarter of trans people have experienced homelessness. That's true. Okay, so from this, just them figures alone, we've kind of built up a bit of a picture um, of what's going on. So amongst the LGBT community, there's higher levels of anxiety, depression, suicide, self-harm, homelessness, um, and also they're not as engaged with the healthcare service with fear of being stigmatized or discriminated against as well. Um, so this is the gender-bred person. Has anyone seen this before? You have. Um, so this basically um, splits up LGBT. So it basically is saying that gender identity um, it's independent to expression, um, it's independent to biological sex and sexual orientation. Um, and again, these are all seen as a scale, um, so they're not binary, male, female, um, gay, straight. Um, but yeah, how someone chooses to express themselves um, is completely different. So you could have someone who's a cisgendered male, i.e. they believe that they're born into the correct body, um, but they may choose to express themselves in a feminine way. Um, so the sound map has just arrived on time. Um, well, hopefully it's, it's working. Um, so I've got a video to stop me from talking for five minutes. Um, and this is just about LGBT um, history of mental health. Um, and it's by a doctor. Um, it's like, yeah. Hopefully it works. Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. My name's Elliot, I'm a junior doctor that's specialising in psychiatry in the UK. And this weekend marks World Pride, and I think the Sorry, 1553 that was brought in by Henry VIII. We could go back even further than that to same-sex relationships that were depicted by the ancient Greeks. But, for time's sake, and to try and maintain your interest, I'm going to go back to the 1950s. So this is a time that homosexuality is illegal. It is a crime that's punishable by like, up to life in prison. There are a lot of kids here, and if we catch you with a homosexual, the rest of your life will be a living hell, and you will be caught 
we have two diagnostic bibles in psychiatry to diagnose mental illness. We have the DSM by the American Psychiatric Association and the ICD by the World Health Organization. The first edition of the DSM came out in 1952 and listed homosexuality as a type of sociopathic personality disorder, a pathological hidden fear of the opposite sex that they thought stemmed from traumatic parent-child relationships. The ICD-7, which came out in 1946, so around about a similar time, included homosexuality as a type of sexual deviance and pathological personality. These are really strong, really harsh, horrible terms. So as well as it being illegal, the general consensus among psychiatrists was that homosexuality wasn't normal, that it was pathological and was a type of mental illness. There were a few exceptions to this thought though. And actually, one of the earliest voices against this was Sigmund Freud. There's a letter that's published online that Sigmund Freud wrote in response to a mother who wrote to him concerned that her son was gay. In this letter, he said, Homosexuality is assuredly no advantage, but it is nothing to be ashamed of. No vice, no degradation, it cannot be classified as an illness. We consider it to be a variation of the sexual function produced by a certain arrest of sexual development. It is a great injustice to persecute homosexuality as a crime. There was also a study in 1956 done by a psychologist called Evelyn Hooker. In this study, she found that there was no difference in what they described as happiness and adjustment between heterosexual and homosexual men. This study became pretty seminal because it was a voice against the common consensus that was existing in both medicine and the law. So it's both illegal and a mental illness, so many people that were gay were either imprisoned or were forced to go through gay conversion therapy that was done by doctors. Gay conversion was a practice that was carried out all around the world and unfortunately still does carry on in small corners of the UK and probably a little bit more widely in lots of other countries and other cultures. The type of so-called treatment was really variable. Some of the main ones included giving emetic drugs designed to induce nausea and vomiting. So a drug called apomorphine was quite commonly given alongside making people watch things like gay porn to try and associate the visceral reaction of nausea and vomiting with gay material. There was also a use of really reckless and dangerous interventions like insulin coma therapy that was also used to try and treat things like depression and schizophrenia. There is evidence that electroconvulsive therapy was used for that reason, and I found some evidence of threats to use the lobotomy, but I couldn't find any concrete evidence that it was ever actually carried out. Prior to the 1950s, probably one of the more pleasant interventions people sometimes would go through as a conversion therapy was being given LSD, and that was before it was then outlawed, around about the time of the Vietnam War. Later on it moved to mainly counselling and psychological therapies, and that's still how it's carried out in these small pockets where it continues today. And it's not just done by doctors, it's also done by psychologists, counsellors and religious leaders. And then in 1967, homosexuality was decriminalised under the Sexual Offences Act, but nonetheless, arrests carried on. If anything, they actually went up because there was a lot of sexual acts between same-sex couples that weren't covered by this law. So it was decriminalised essentially in name only. So next up, we're going to talk about probably one of the most seminal moments in LGBT history, which is the Stonewall Riots. In the wee small hours of the 28th of June in 1969, the police raided a gay bar called the Stonewall Inn in Lower Manhattan. This was done by the police's um, public morality squad. That was a thing. So remember, this was a time that homosexuality was both illegal and diagnosed as a mental illness. You had like the FBI keeping lists of gay people, they're then outed in the newspapers. This meant that gay bars were sort of a haven for self-expression and were a bit of an escape and respite from the harassment and discrimination that was so widespread. The Stonewall Inn was owned by the Mafia and the Mafia tended to pay off the police to turn a blind eye. They'd also try and extort some of the wealthier patrons of the bar as well. But on this day, the raid happened nonetheless. People were charged with soliciting homosexual relations or wearing non-gender appropriate clothing, which is very, very subjective. Only this time, the patrons fought back. They were sick of it absolutely sick of the hate and the discrimination. The riots continued until the 1st of July 1969 and the crowds ended up growing to thousands of people. And although we can 
trace sort of gay rights activism back to even the 1800s, these Stonewall riots were a really seminal moment because they led to the formation of the Gay Liberation Front, and it was them that went on to arrange the first Pride Parade that happened the year after, on the first anniversary of these riots, with marches in New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles. And then if we go to 1972, that was when the first ever London Pride happened. Accounts of who threw the first item and how the riots actually happened are quite varied and seem to be caught up and clouded in a lot of folklore, for lack of a better term. But to be honest, I don't think that really matters. And homosexuality wasn't removed from the DSM until its fourth edition in 1994 and from the ICD until 1992. That was a lot more recent than even I appreciated. Although the fight for equality continues, the improvement that people like me experience today owe an indescribable amount to those that really rebelled 50 years ago. As always, thank you very much for checking out the channel, thank you for checking out the video. Make sure you like, leave any comments below, and make sure you subscribe to the channel. Um, so, the definition of <laughs> um, transgender is basically someone who feels that they're not the same gender um, as they were assigned at birth. Um, the original term was transsexual, um, and it's basically the same definition that some people felt like the sex and transsexual um, had different connotations. So we've kind of moved away from that, um, but you'll see in a wee minute that the ICD-10 still refers to it as transsexualism. Um, so transgender people tend to experience gender dysphoria. Um, this is a symptom, um, and it's basically a distressed state um, whenever they look at themselves, knowing that their gender identity is different to their biological sex. Um, I sat in a gender clinic, and for these people, a lot of their experiences are very real, um, and yeah, they go through a very difficult time as their body changes um, in puberty and adolescence in ways that they don't like. Um, so does anyone have any questions about that, or any um, need any power of passion? Okay, so we talked a bit about transgender history. Um, in 1755, Charlotte Clark was the first openly um, transgender person in the UK, and um, she's definitely not the first transgender person. That um, history goes way far further back in time. Um, in 1950s, Christine Gordonson um, had um, gender confirming surgery. Um, this was after she fought in World War II, um, and she had her surgery in Denmark, went back to America and featured on the New York Times, um, which was one of the big bestsellers, and she really was quite a trailblazer. Um, in 1966, Harry Benjamin published the first major textbook on the subject. 1969 were the Stonewall Riots, which was mentioned in the video earlier. Um, transgender people were heavily involved in this, and I think that it's important for LGBT people to remember that. Um, whilst the man said that um, they don't know who threw the first brick, um, some people will say that it was Martha P. Johnson, um, who was a transgender woman in New York. Um, and in 2004, the UK Gender Recognition Act was passed, so this allowed transgender people to change their gender um, legally. Um, this is currently up for reform at the minute because despite the law and a lot of transgender people haven't actually taken it up and I think it's quite a difficult process um, for that. But if anyone has any questions, they can ask me about that at the end. Okay, so let's, we're at a psychiatry conference. Um, this is the ICD-10. Are you all familiar with it? So basically the ICD is the World Health Organization and um, their um, classification of psychiatric um, conditions. So gender identity disorders is, has the code F64, and transsexualism um, is one of them. So to this day, being transgender is still classified as um, a mental disorder. And if we look at the criteria, so the clinical information, it says that they have to experience severe gender dysphoria, 
can't wish to change those sites. So, now's the right time to talk about the special interest group. Um, so Royal College of Psychiatry has many special interest groups. Um, as I said, I'm the, the new student rep for the LGBT one, which is also the Rainbow Special Interest Group. Um, and one of their major accomplishments recently um, was the push for declassifying being trans as a mental disorder. Um, and they were successful. Um, and it's something that they should be very proud of. Um, so from the new ICD-11, which is being introduced in 2022, um, it will no longer be a mental disorder. And instead of being under the gender identity disorder classification, it will be under gender incongruence. So yeah, that was a great accomplishment. And this is great for trans people. Um, I spoke to the psychiatrist who was one of the leaders um, in this at the time, um, and he said that for trans people, this is like whenever homosexuality was also taken off the ICD time or ICD at the time. So yeah, if I talk a bit about what they do, and um, this started in two thousand and one. Um, initially, it's for gay and lesbian mental health, and recently have been expanded to include gender identity as well. So. They're doing educational seminars um, within the Royal College, um, and they also do advisory work for the Royal College as well. So they release position statements. Um, so for example, um, on conversion therapy, um, I read one quite recently um, where they said that you know, there's no evidence to support this and it's not beneficial to anyone. Um, and then, as I said, they were instrumental in changing um, the transgender thing in the ICD-10. So they also surveyed the membership to look at LGBT participation um, and also thinking about where we can go forward next. And lastly, they're going to be at International Congress this year, which I believe is in Edinburgh. Maybe someone can correct. I think it is, yeah, um, in July, and they'll be doing a workshop there. Um, so that's great. So if we look at some of the headlines which um, have been making the news today, um, predominantly we'll look at mental health, obviously. So the first one, puberty blockers linked to lower suicide risk for transgender people. There's a lot of debate about giving younger people um, hormones or puberty blockers. Um, and actually, as I said about the position statements that the SIG make, um, they say that there's no evidence at the minute but there needs to be more evidence and they wouldn't rule it out. Um, so no one's against it, um, but unfortunately for trans people, they can't get hormones until they're 16 in the UK on the NHS. It's not illegal to obtain them, um, but the NHS won't provide them. So there's a GP in Wales who's happy to prescribe hormones for people under the age of 16, um, but also a lot of people look online, and this obviously, is quite dangerous. I mean, our society page, we started last year, and since then we've received a message about, can you provide me with hormones, please? I see that you're a health, LGBT health society or something, and we obviously said, I'm sorry, we can't. <laughs> um, and yeah, transgender people are more likely to develop depression or anxiety. And I think that some of the figures from that and Stonewall survey are quite shocking. Um, there's still a bit of a taboo about coming out. Um, it's very topical at the minute, obviously, with Philip Schofield yesterday. Um, but people within different communities can struggle to come out um, as LGBT. And um, this example is from the traveling community, but also BME people and people from religious backgrounds as well. Um, it's still quite taboo. Um, and yeah, as I said, LGBT people more four more times likely to self-harm as well. Um, so these are quite shocking figures. And it paints quite a bad picture. Um, it's not all bad. There's lots of services out there, which I'll speak about at the end. Um, but you have to think about why this is happening. And unfortunately, we don't live in a perfect world. And whilst we like to think that we're moving forward, there are still things happening out there which are bad. So 
my first example of that is the rise in hate crime since 2016. Have any of you read this story? Mm. Yes, yeah, so this was a lesbian couple coming home from a night out and they were attacked in a homophobic hate crime. Um, so yeah, that's just one example. Um, there's lots of protests outside Birmingham schools about LGBT inclusive um, education. And you know, these aren't about sex or anything about that. It's simply just saying two mummies or two daddies in a storybook instead of just your conventional family. And um, it's just to normalize it, really. Then we've got our professional trolls, who, well, thankfully, I don't think she'll be tweeting anytime soon. Um, and she, I mean, she says, I'm not transphobic, just don't ask me to call a castrated man a woman. Um, so she might need to look up her definition of transphobic. Um, and then even it's quite sad that within the LGBT community, unfortunately, we all can't seem to get along. Um, there's a lot of racism and there's a lot of transphobia as well. Um, this LGB alliance started literally last month. They had their um, big lunch. I think it was in Glasgow, it was in Scotland. Um, and whilst they claim that they're not transphobic, I can tell you that they're definitely not doing anything for trans equality. Um, so yeah. I don't know how much time we've got left. Do you know? Five minutes, sorry. Can I just say something? Yeah, this is like I saw also not quite an isolated event. In my home country, I'm Polish. Mm -hmm. And we had a case of uh, LGBTQ, like uh, a, a also like LGBTQ pride like mm -hmm. march. And we had a case of people blocking the church like literally creating a barricade and some even throwing stones uh, at people. And from my perspective, it was like, I was afraid uh, because I had a few friends going at that mm. area. And uh, I was afraid, genuinely afraid and embarrassed of my country because so like behind of everything. Mm. And finally, when I read the newspaper and read some reports, I found out that they, their justification for this was to protect the church or like keep the purity and I was like, mm. I was in a state of perpetual shock every time I heard this. Yeah, so it's a matter of education as well, isn't it? Um, I did hear about, I've got a Polish friend and yeah, it was awful what happened there. Um, yeah, it's a matter of educating people and how do we do that in a sensible um, and realistic way. Um, my personal opinion is that sometimes um, you just have to accept that perhaps people will never agree and you just have to live your life the way that you wish to live it. Um, but yeah, I hope that things get better. Does anyone else want to, because I don't think we were going to do group discussions um, based on scenarios or cases that we have, um, but I don't think we're probably going to have time because of our technical difficulties. And does anyone else want to throw some comments or any questions? Um, I was just going to say, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but mm. isn't there only one like, like gender clinic that actually offers the hormone therapy, which is in London, I think, for younger? So each region has their gender specialists. Yeah. And um, I know that, so like, yeah, it has to really be a gender specialist psychiatrist um, or GPs as well can specialize in it too. Yeah. Um, so basically, if someone goes to their, I looked up this yesterday, if someone goes to their GP and they wish to, um, you know, get hormones or stuff like that, um, they do need to see a psychiatrist. But if this wait's going to be two years or it's going to be what's deemed as too long, um, they can actually in the interim get hormone therapy. Um, I know that whenever I was at that um, clinic, the Brighton does a lot of the actual surgery. Um, I should also mention that not all transgender people will want to have 
gender-confirming surgery or even hormones. Um, but yeah, I think that that um, is centralised there. But I think that otherwise, the hormones and stuff like that you can get elsewhere. Does anyone else? Um, Okay, so we were meant to do the cases. I think we're just from out of time. But yeah, these are some of the support networks that are out there. And um, a lot of these are just directing people. Um, but yeah, they're very good. So okay, everyone happy? <laughs> I think we just have to... Yeah, so um, we should all have the colours on your badge.